Hey, what's up? This is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and in this episode, I get a chance to talk to Joe Heitzberg from Crowd Cow. If you haven't heard about Crowd Cow, you'll definitely be interested in checking them out after this interview. Uh, chances are you have heard about it. Maybe you don't know what it is. It, it's an interesting concept. Uh, he and a partner started this company about four years ago, and they give you an opportunity to purchase a portion of a cow and it's a it's like it's like crowdfunding but with a cow and they've added additional anim animals they've added uh, pigs and chickens and, and whatnot it started out with the simple concept that you can buy a portion of a cow and then once the entire cow is uh, is chosen by people you get that portion uh, but the the big big takeaway from this is that you get to know the farmers and how they treat the cows and so so that way you know from the specific farmer to you getting the the meat uh, where it's come from and that these are small little farmers across the United States as well as Japan and uh, now they've added a couple other countries but it's 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 a very unique concept and we go into depth about the farmers we go into depth about um, how important that is we talk a lot about because they're although they have a lots of different cuts of meats uh, they're really really known for their wagyu meat and uh, that's something that we go into to depth about what it is what wagyu is what kobe is um, what the different grading uh, criteria are and it, it just it's it's a fascinating interview it's full of a lot of information if you've ever wondered anything about japanese beef or beef in general or what crowd cow is you're gonna love this uh, and after you watch this i know you'll be interested the people at crowd cow gave me a special link for my listeners and viewers it's uh, crowdcow.com slash Kevin. Uh, super easy. You get $25 off. Uh, this is not an, uh, a paid endorsement. This is just a great way to get <laughs> $25 off on your first order. So that's uh, pretty awesome. And if you're digging these, please subscribe. That way you don't miss out on any of the episodes. They'll go into your YouTube feed. I have a podcast, which uh, I'll have a podcast version of this and a bunch of other cool podcast uh, episodes. That's uh, just check Kevin's BBQ joints on any of your podcast networks. I have a uh, website at kevinsbbqjoints.com with tons of other information, as well as cool stuff on the Los Angeles barbecue scene that you might be interested in. But enjoy. Good morning, Joe. How you doing? Good morning. <laughs> I'm glad we got this together. Yeah, uh, for sure. Thanks yeah. for having me. And uh, yeah, the, the marvels of Skype, it's a uh, fantastic. Uh, so what's, what is a usual day for you? What is, that's how I kind of like to start these off. Like what, how, 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 is there a usual day? A usual day. <laughs> or what's your that's day like today other than talking to me? Oh, what is a usual day like? I thought you meant like which day of the week is usual. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good every day. Is, every day is different. Um, every day is different. Today's kind of a crazy day because we've got, um, get into work and speak with you. And then we've got a local TV station coming in to interview us about women in leadership because we've hired two fantastic oh. women in key leadership spots in the last two months. Oh, cool. So we're doing a video about that. And, and then I'm flying to Austin, Texas, taking with me an A5 grade Wagyu brisket, actually oh. multiple, which we're going to be doing low and slow at Kreitz's legendary barbecue in Lockhart, oh, as cool. well as La Barbecue. So it's sort of the new school barbecue and the old school barbecue with something that, that neither one really has a lot of experience with because it's almost impossible to get, mm -hmm. A5 brisket. And that's what I'm doing this afternoon. So that's definitely not a usual day, but yeah, yeah. Uh, every once in a while. <laughs> that's cool. A lot, of, a lot of my viewers will be excited to hear about that, like knowing that you're doing that and then also hear how that turned out because they, they're both big fans of both those. I tell you, we've been doing a lot of, uh, beef from all over the U.S. and Japan and a lot of A5 Wagyu, of course, but we have never done brisket. And we, we thought, like, it's pretty impossible to find A5 grade brisket in the U.S. So, um, and the Japanese don't have a tradition of smoking brisket. True, true. So th there's, a, there's a lot of unknowns about, like, how, what would happen to it if you smoked it? And so we were excited to, to bring it to people, but, but, like, we had to cook it ourselves. We had to give it to a few barbecue experts to play with to make sure... Like, is it actually good? Because we don't want to do something that's just a gimmick. Um, we smoked our first one, and Jacob here in the office, who's got the most experience, low and slow, he's from Texas and does it all the time, and uh, smoked his first one here, and we all tried it, and it was absolutely fantastic. It was 
blew, it blew everyone away. It was really good. It and then, and then when you have a brisket of of greater quality, you could tell the difference. And especially on that A five, I I can't imagine how great that will taste. That's yeah. I mean, you know, when the only thing I've learned about cooking is it's not about like all the steps and different spices, just about quality of mm-hmm. ingredients. Oh yeah, that's like most of the challenge. Yeah, you could do all those steps, and if you don't have good quality ingredients, you, you might as well. Yeah. yeah, how how are you traveling with that? Is that something like you got a seat next to you? Because that's that's some expensive cargo that you're. Bringing. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, it's just it's about the size of a baby. It's yeah, fine. I guess uh, it's, you'll it's have it hidden, hidden in a little. <laughs> not a big deal. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll be interesting. Getting if you had to get that through security, that'll be an interesting uh, yeah. discussion. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. I have friends that travel to Texas, and like he travels to Texas, and he brings back barbecue for his wife all the time. And it's always an interesting discussion in security. It just all depends if the TSA person likes meat or not. True, yeah, yeah. If they're a vegan, then you're in trouble. <laughs> That's right. So, so tell me about yourself. What's your background? My background is um, I was born in Texas, so I'm happy to go back to my birth town. My my son is telling me go to the hospital and take a photo of the hospital you were born at. Yeah, <laughs> so cute. That but is- I was born in Texas, and I got into. Um, high tech in, in undergrad. We were just talking offline before this. So I was a double major in Japanese and, and computer science. Mm-hmm. So um, I ended up doing a lot of time in the basement computer lab and then as a foreign exchange student in Hokkaido where I lived on a farm. Oh, actually. Hokkaido. And, That's a dream yeah. location. Ah. We were, I was harvesting potatoes and negi and daikon and all these things. And on my 20th birthday in Japan, we actually roasted an entire Wagyu steer. Oh. Which was pretty awesome. At the time, I had no idea. What is this? You know, this special beef? I don't know. I was just eating it, you know. Yeah, you had probably, no idea how great it was. I was probably drinking a lot. <laughs> but but it was, um, but you know, I studied computer science. I graduated. I was a software engineer. And then after that, shortly after that, I started my career. I was basically an entrepreneur. I was just creating creating things, creating websites, creating businesses. Just before this, I've been at this for nearly four years. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to ask you how long it's been. It's, you know, it's... Uh, but getting into this was, um, I was actually working for an investment company uh, that, that was spinning out companies. So I wasn't an investor. I wasn't a, a venture capitalist. I was like the entrepreneur in residence. <laughs> and I was helping them create new companies or vet company ideas. Um, but uh, this idea, you know, one of the guys who was working with me at the time kind of came to work and he said, oh, I'm so excited because on Friday I'm getting my cow. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, what? <laughs> and he was like, well, I get the beef of a single cow every single year. I've been doing it for six, seven years. And I got to tell you, the beef is incredible. It tastes so good. And I was like, honestly, I was like, really? It tastes better than like the grocery store? Oh my God, yes, better. What about restaurants like a steakhouse? Oh, so much better. He goes, when I pull out a steak cut out of my freezer and I cook it, he goes, I can taste my cow. <laughs> and I was, I was like, that's... I didn't know that they could taste different. I didn't know they could be better. I didn't know that you could go to a farm and meet the farmer. He talked about the farmer. He talked about how the farmer cared about the animal and the environment there. He talked about the pristine fields of grass. It was out on Woodby Island, which is near Seattle. It's a pristine you know, uh, place. Yeah. You can go on vacation three days, mm-hmm. weekends. Everything. And he was talking about the farmer, how nice of a person he was, how he could trust him, you know, how he felt really good feeding this beef to his kids and eating it. And, and it just felt better. And I was like, wow, I'm really jealous. Yeah, I'm and super jealous. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't share any. I was like, give me some. You know, he wouldn't share. He was like, the farm only slaughters once a year. You're too late. You know, you got to wait a year. And I'm like, well, how would it work? Well, I drive a truck out there. You know, I have a big meat freezer. I'm like, well, how many pounds of meat is it? Yeah. He's like, 550 pounds. I'm like, whoa. Wow. So the idea of crowd cow emerged from that that romantic ideal. Know where your beef comes from so you can ensure that the person who produced it cared about the animal, cared about the land, cared about their family, their community, and produced a better tasting, healthier beef than you could possibly get anywhere else. And that's what I want to serve with my buddies or to my children. That's what I want. And I can't get it. It's so frustrating. As an entrepreneur, you're like, oh, that's just an opportunity. So riffing on that idea with my co-founder, Ethan, Ethan's brilliant idea was, let's just have a website. You know, you can meet the farm virtually. There's one cow for sale, all of the cuts nose to tail, and you can just pick as little or as much as you want. And when all of the shares are claimed, you know, it's crowdfunded cow. Mm-hmm. Uh, the cow tips and we all become stakeholders. stakeholders. <laughs> I love, yeah, I've, I've, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was just too good, too good of an idea, too fun. We wanted that better beef, you know, which we now call craft beef generically mm-hmm. or craft meat if you're talking about pork and chicken, yeah. which is... That which is produced by these small, sustainable 
family run farms where you can know the person who produced it, raised it. And that direct connection creates a better experience from the table and a like direct chain of accountability to the practices that you care about as a consumer. Which you don't get often. You don't get that often unless you go to a farmer's market to get vegetable. Like you don't see that, yeah. That's the only place you can get it is a farmer's market. Now, if you have a protein supplier at the farmer's market, first of all, you're lucky already. Yeah, you're already lucky, but, yeah. But your selection is going to be limited to like one, maybe two. Exactly. You know? And what we're, we're doing is we're, we have over 100 producers. So on any given day on Proud Cow, you might find, uh, of course, Angus beef, but you might find Wagyu from Japan. You might find Wagyu raised in America, crossbred with Angus. You might find Piedmontese, which, by the way, is a beef almost no one's heard of that would, they would eat every day if they could. It and is, that's, is that Italian? Piedmontese comes from Italy originally, but there are breeders here. I mean, it's just like going to the dog show. You know, you meet these farmers and they're like, oh yeah, we specialize in Piedmontese. Here's what we feed them to get them to taste a certain way. And like Piedmontese is this crazy breed that as an animal genetically produces too much muscle that it needs. So they're really like bulbous and look really weird. But because of that, and they're not really using those muscles, the meat is super lean, yet incredibly tender. Wow. So you look at it, if you look at a New York steak Piedmontese, you'd kind of go like, I don't know if I want that one until you ate it. Wow. Then you would, you would be like, I want that one every single day. It's like, that's the best New York. Wow. You know, it's just, it's like Wagyu without the fat. It's crazy. It's, that, it's really, and I'm sure most people listening to this don't know about that at all. No, I mean, we do it. We're here at the office, kind of on the cutting edge because we get to do tasting flights of different things and we get to compare and contrast. And, you know, here's the other thing most people don't know. Like the education level of the market right now is like, oh yeah, there's grass fed and there's grain fed. Exactly. There's two. <laughs> I guess there's that Japanese stuff. And we look at it, we're in talking to all these farmers the first thing they'll tell you if you actually go visit a farm and talk about their grass-fed beef is they'll say, oh, there are many kinds of grass and all the beef will taste different. So Montana clump grass is different from the grass growing in Washington. And guess what? In northern Texas, they don't grow grass. So if you're getting beef from northern Texas and they're calling it grass-fed, well, it's probably eating grass pellets that have been imported from overseas. Wow. Is that really what you thought you were buying? And it had a stock art photograph of the founder of the company kissing a cow or whatever. So like we're trying to break through that just saying we're not creating a beef brand. We crowd cow is not a beef brand. We're trying to create a marketplace. We want to showcase the little guy, the little producers, make it direct. We're not beef producers. We're a marketplace. So it's a very different approach. Educating people too. Yeah. Trying to do a lot of that with video, Instagram, with blog posts. Um, you know, tomorrow, like I'm heading tonight to Texas to do this, um, uh, eight, five brisket yeah. with a couple of old school and a new school barbecue joint in yeah. Texas and Austin. And so we'll be streaming that and talking about it with people who know more than I do about brisket. It's an interesting concept, something that a lot of people are, will will be used to. So then, so, so, so how did you, so you said this, this, this essentially started four years ago. Was it, was there a ramp up? How did you get the company going or did you, because you were working at that company, you were able to get the funding and make it work like it's I, people are always curious as how people get things started like how from that germ of an idea how long did it take to actually have things up and running yeah i mean it took a while we we from that first conversation like oh that'd be a cool idea what if there was a web page it was like just a conversation until the next morning where it was like i keep i'm still thinking about that after sleeping on it like i can't like first of all i want that beef really mm -hmm. bad i want that connection to the farmer I still want to try that and taste it for myself. And I just love the idea that there'd be a website to make that easy. Yeah. And so like, it was like, we got to do something about this feeling. And so then it was like, okay, well, let's sit down. What can we do in the next like few days to verify the idea? Mm -hmm. And that discussion became um, what I've learned over the years, like as an entrepreneur or working with entrepreneurs is like, you always have to ask like, what can we do over the next, you tend to want to plan. Like, what can we do over the next week? And that turns into a three-month plan. You actually should go the opposite way. Okay, what can we do over the next week? And then ask the question, like, what can we do in the next one hour? Hmm. You know, and that the answer was like, well, I could call 10 of my friends and you can call 10 of your friends and we could just give them the elevator pitch and just see what the reaction is. It's not a bad idea. Yeah, so we did that right on the spot. And the reaction was like, either like, I would never do that. That's like, I don't eat meat. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm a vegetarian. Or it was like, I would totally do that right now if I had a website and a credit card. You know, it was like, I'm in. 
So we, based on that, we were encouraged and we thought our friends love us. They want us to feel good. So let's mm -hmm. talk to strangers. So we went like literally the next hour, we went to the nearest Starbucks and we just talked to random strangers. It was what? like, yeah, excuse me, sir. Do you eat, uh, can I ask you about beef? You know, and we had the same reaction. It was just like we had strangers asking us for the URL, you know. And well, and, and people, but people also, too, in that situation, I think a lot of people would be nervous to talk to other people because they're in their minds this idea is going to get stolen. It's like, so what, what, keep, what, what stopped, what didn't stop you from doing that? Is that because you knew that they, to get, the, get it rolling, it, t it takes a lot of work and it's not? Yeah, it takes a lot of work. I mean, it, it's really hard. Um, I mean, we've got over 100 small firms in our, in our network. Yeah, which now is, it's, yeah. You know, that's, that's, they've all got to be happy, yeah. too. You know, and the customers have to be happy. There's a lot you have to do to make that all work and, and get to scale. Yeah. I'm, I'm never, um, you know, people always obsess about competitors or, or yeah. that, but, but it's really your biggest competition is your own self to execute. I agree completely. It's, it's sort of like hiking. You just put one foot in front of the other and keep going. And every once in a while you, you, you turn around and look down and your car is teeny tiny down there in the bottom of the parking lot or whatever. You went, wow, we've come quite a ways. Just one step after the other. And the people that, that aren't concerned about their – that are more concerned about creating a great product are the ones that are most successful. Like when, when Google came out, there was Yahoo had search. There's a lot of people that had search, and, and people thought, well, we don't need another show. <laughs> Google did okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> So, yeah. so, so now, so how, so as it grew, did you start off with one, like one or two farmers or how did you even know how to go to the farmer? Yeah. I mean, we just observed what we saw out there at, at other venues that sell meat, you know, and we just looked and we, and we made a lot of cold calls. Google was not actually very helpful. You know, a lot of, um, farms, even that go to a farmer's market don't really even have a website. That's true. That's very true. Or, or they might, but, but it doesn't say anything about them. You know, it's just like, there's no information. Like, mm -hmm. is it? Who are these people? What what breed is it? What are their practices? They don't really say. And, he, and these labels, you know, these labels like certified this or that. I was reading from a, an email I got from a, another website about their turkey. And it was like, the turkeys have access to pasture certified. I'm like, what does that mean, access to pasture? <laughs> it means they're in a giant closed thing with a little door that they never walk through. Mm -hmm. and, and so you really can't just read and understand. You have For to sure. So we knew that right away from the beginning, and we, we, we just had to drive and knock on doors, you know, it was like, and, and, and meet people. And then we met this, then once we got the first farm and the second farm, we asked them, who are the other good farms that you trust that are in your neighborhood? You know, we asked the slaughter guy, like, hey, you see carcasses every day. True. Right? Which carcasses look the best to you, mm -hmm. you know? And can you introduce those farms? And which ones, you know, should we avoid? And he yeah. was very forthcoming to tell us his opinion because he been seeing carcasses his whole life and you know it was uh what was what was the first farm do you remember which the first farm was the very first farm that we ever worked with was was called gleason ranch yeah and then the second one was called harlow ranch yeah uh, where are those based out of they're both based out of just about an hour drive south of uh seattle so you started kind of locally obviously oh yeah we were totally local and we're still very concentrated locally in terms of our supply because we started here and and but we've got local options for people all over the country now mm -hmm. too which okay. is nice. So what is crowd cow now? Like if, so say someone's interested in, so do you have minimums, all that, all that. So crowd cow now is a, is a site where in one place you can have access to a marketplace of beef, pork, and chicken providers that are all independently run, family run and managed with the best possible practices. And you'll have access to diversity of flavor and quality level that you just can't get anywhere else. Okay. And you'll always have the name of the farmer on the pack of meat, gotcha. which is something that literally no one else will give you. Now, how much, how much do you need to like, say, say I'm interested in a, in a cow. Is there a specific amount that I, I need, I need to purchase or like, cause in, in my, in someone's mind, they might think that sounds like a lot of cow. Like they're not going to like, if they, what percentage are they getting or when, what cuts like they get to choose. Cause I played around the site, but I, I want to know for other people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of promotions running all the time. This is like cyber month period. I'll just go like this and I'll go like, use this URL. And then later I'll give you a URL that you can put in here. <laughs> I know. I, it comes up in my Instagram feed a lot. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Because we, we run different promotions all the time depending on where you're coming from or, or what, you're, uh, what, you're, what you're ordering. But there definitely is. I mean, in terms of overcoming the overhead of like shipping, you know, mm -hmm. you have to have like an order minimum or something in order to get like a free shipping. Gotcha. And, and typically we charge a little bit for shipping. A lot of people think Japanese like cow is all Kobe beef. 
or right. it's or wagyu. What is? Can you explain kind of the difference so people can understand what what they're getting or what they yeah, sure. should be getting? <laughs> so you say Kobe beef, and that's like the the term that everyone knows. Uh -huh. The easiest way to understand what Kobe beef means is it's a brand name like Coca Cola. Gotcha. That's that's the easiest way. Kobe beef is like a brand name like Coca Cola, but it does mean something. What it means is a particular breed of cattle raised and slaughtered in Japan in a particular region, which also got rated to a certain level of quality. So with that, for Kobe beef to become Kobe beef, by the way, it also means that the producer, the slaughterhouse, and the person selling it to you all paid the Kobe beef brand name <laughs> to be able to say that it's Kobe beef. But they have to qualify by being the, the breed Kuroge Washu, they have to have been raised and bred and slaughtered in Hyogo Prefecture, Japan, which is near Kobe, going yes. south. And then it has to achieve a rating in terms of the marble quality of an A4 or A5. It's a yield and marble score. Yeah. It's done by professional raiders only in Japan that have been trained for like three years. And it's usually three graders at a time comparing their scores. Gotcha. So it's a very meticulous process to get that rating. That's Kobe beef to get that brand. Gotcha. So within, But here's the other cool thing to understand. So Wagyu is the other second most famous word, Wagyu. Mm -hmm. Wagyu just means Japanese cow, literally. So if you think about the meaning of the word Japanese cow, what are the cow breeds that are native to Japan, right? Okay. There are four of them. One of them is special. One of them is the Kuroge Washu. So to be Kobe beef, you are one of the four breeds, you're Kuroge Washu. Okay. And all these other things happen. Okay, so a lot of people will sell like, it's Wagyu, or they'll sell it's Kobe, this or that. If people are selling you it's Kobe, this or that in America, probably it isn't. Probably not, yeah, that's what I was going to say. There's only a handful of restaurants that are in that system and can legally sell it or import it. Mm -hmm. And there's very few in terms of the pounds of it even coming over. Okay. So Wagyu burger, American Kobe, uh, American Kobe beef burger, Costco even have a pack of burgers called Wa uh, Kobe. Burgers. Crazy. So what? So what do you think it is then? It's typically, I would say, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, if you see the word Wagyu and it's for sale in the U.S., it's going to be an Angus beef crossbred Cross. with a Wagyu DNA, and that Wagyu DNA may be one of the four Kuroge, the one that actually is special and creates that marbling, mm -hmm. but it could also be Akaushi, which is very popular in the U.S. and is not special in that way gotcha. at all. But people will breed it, they'll crossbreed it, so they can call it Wagyu. So they can use the name. They can charge a higher price. But I'll tell you this. I've probably eaten my body weight times 10 in all kinds of Wagyu, both in Japan and in America, including purebred, crossbreed, everything. And I've never tasted a Angus cross Wagyu that didn't taste like Angus. In other words, at best, what you're getting when you see Wagyu is something that's like Angus, but marbled. So it's like it's like an Angus, but like an Angus Prime mm -hmm. or a Prime Plus. You know, it's great beef. I'm not dissing it. I love it. I would eat it. I'll, you can eat a lot of it. It's really delicious. It can be really good. But when somebody says, I've got Wagyu, it's probably Wagyu cross Angus. We call it Wangus. Okay. <laughs> and it's going to taste like Angus, but it might be some marbling. There's no regulation. There's no quality control. How much marbling? I don't know. Was it Kuroge? or Akaushi, which is not special. I don't know. Was it 5% crossbreed in the DNA or 50%? I don't know. No one can tell you. It's just unknown. But you can jump over to the world of the breeders. And in America, and we work with all of the top ones, there are breeders who do the Kuroge Washu DNA at 100% purity, traceable in the family tree to Japan. So these are called full blood Wagyu. These are just the exact same DNA that would be like in a Kobe beef in Japan in terms of that same breed. And they'll get way more marbling and they'll get a sweet umami taste. It's a completely different experience. But there's only like 25,000 of those animals in the US, which is minuscule given the many, many million cattle overall. So they're, so it's hard, so you're not gonna, you're not gonna be eating that. If you're in a restaurant and you see, you know, Wagyu and they just say Wagyu and they use Japanese characters on the menu and everything else. It's probably not even the purebred stuff raised here. It's probably Angus Cross Wagyu, and it might be delicious. Just know what you're getting. We sell Wagyu Cross Angus, and we call it Wagyu Cross Angus, and we explain what it, we explain what it is, and we also sell the purebred. We also sell the stuff from Japan. Our shtick is like 
we're not a beef brand. We just want you as the consumer to know what you're getting. You're being transparent, which is important. Transparent and have selection. Yeah. I'd like, I'd love, we've done tasting flights of just Wagyu. Like Wagyu Angus Cross, purebred, which is 90, you know, 4%, 93% and above. Full blood, which is 100% DNA from America. Grass finished Wagyu, it's 100%. That's cool. And then the Japanese That's stuff, which is grain finished using Inawata rice straw. In some cases, we've got stuff using olive peels called olive wagyu, all these yeah. exotic varieties, rated A5. You know, Kobe beef can be rated A4 or A5 to qualify as Kobe beef. So A5 is the high end of Kobe beef. That's what we sell. And it comes from Kagoshima, which is a different region that's actually better for breeding cattle in Japan. <laughs> but you can lay all these out in one tasting flight and just experience different flavors. And it's it's great fun. I'm, so we're not, I'm not, I'm not of the mind like this is better than that. Like, I don't think an A5 Kagoshima is like better than a Wagyu Angus Cross. It's different, and it's much higher priced. It's a totally different flavor experience. Well, it's like wine. It's there's. It's just like wine or beer. Or beer. You know, the first time the, I had, you have to keep an open mind. Mm-hmm. The first time that you tried an IPA, did you like it? Honestly, probably not. You know, it was and too. Then, it was probably too like too forward. It was uh, a yeah, yeah. intimidating. Do you like it your now? Palate. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and for sure. You know, Anyone who loves IPA now, I don't think many of them can truthfully say they loved it the first time. I can agree. I've, ta- I've actually had that discussion with people. Yeah. So, Can you explain the, the, the grading, too, a little bit? Like people, the A4, A5, what does that all mean? What is... Yeah, sure. Um, I thought this might come up. So I... <laughs> this is an infographic you can find on our blog. If you just search Crowd Cow Wagyu infographic. Okay, I'll put that in. I, I'm doing a companion blog piece, so I'll put that in there. So. Oh, nice. But this explains how the ratings done. I've been to many um, Japanese Wagyu auctions mm-hmm. and rating procedures. But so the basis of it is they're basically grading on um, two things: the yield, which is like a very um, it'd be like if if you're not the producer as a consumer, you don't really care. But it basically means how much meat came off of the bones. Okay, okay. Yield, and then the other would be the the, the fat quality and concentration. So how much fat is in there and how evenly dispersed is it? Okay. And based on those two things, you get a BMS score, which is the raw marbling score. It goes from 1 to 12. 12 is the highest. Mm -hmm. And then based on that and the yield, you get a a coarse grain grade, A1 through A5. A4 and A5 are the two coarse grain categories where in Japan you would would consider it like a luxury beef, like a special occasion meal. It, 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 you can't eat a lot of it. It's so rich. Mm-hmm. You know, you sear it, you eat it, you're full because it's so rich and it's delicious. It melts in your mouth. That's the A4 and the A5. Okay. And um, essentially, that's the system. So you said that across the board, you have a bunch of different, you have lots of different breeds, lots of different types of cows with yeah. lots of like Angus, uh, cross Now, are you sourcing cattle from Japan too? Yeah, we're doing it um, in two regions in uh, Kagawa Prefecture where they produce an olive wagyu. Yeah, we work with three farms directly in Kagawa Prefecture uh, in co- close coordination with the government of, of Kagawa and the governor, I've come to know. Um, and there are only um, 2,000 animals in Japan, in, in Kagawa, that are all of fed wog. It's very niche and very special. And it kind of became an up-and-coming uh, food sensation within Japan. So very limited quantity. And we work with the top three farms and we get as much as we can get, which is a very tiny quantity. And we always sell it out. It's and it's beautiful, wonderful beef. It's delicious, and it has a high oleic acid concentration due to the olive feed, and so it's a sweeter taste and it's a healthier uh, fat actually for the, for your arteries. I'm going to actually put links to those videos because it's it, it's just, it's fascinating. It's really interesting. Yeah. Now, so you guys, you said you sell out of that. So is that something that people can constantly be checking to see if you have it available? Or? You'd have to you'd have to sign up on our list. Uh, most of the time, we sold it. We've only sold it to existing pre-existing crowd cow customers just okay. because we know that it goes fast and, and there's, uh, you know, people get disappointed if they're like, I've been a customer for a year and I can't buy it. You know, yeah. there's just very little of it and, okay. and we'd rather make it special than just jack the price. Gotcha. That said, it's, it's also the most expensive beef you could, you could imagine. I mean, it, it's worth it. It's really rare and special. And then we do a lot of beef from um, a couple of farms in Kagoshima, Japan, which is uh, the so- southern part of Japan. And, uh, a gr- for as far as for raising cattle goes, it's like a temperate climate, and it's a great it's a great environment. So J- in Japan, Kagoshima. So there's a, a all country wagyu meetup in Japan, like a contest at the national level that only happens once every five years. Okay. And the, in Japan, they're very it's like a competitive cattle show, and they happen at the like local level and the provincial level and the you know. Um, 
and the like national level every five years, once every five years. They happen all the time at the local level. Last year it took place, um, and Kagoshima beef had the highest average score across the 12 competitive wow. categories at the Wagyu Olympics. Wow. So Kago, and that's because Kagoshima is amazingly passionate about raising high quality beef, and it's because it's a very temperate climate to do that in. And so people have an opportunity for, for some of those cows? Yep, exactly. And then in the Kagawa beef, the olive Wagyu we get, it actually won last year at the Wagyu Olympics the best fat category. Really? Yeah. And fat's kind of what Wagyu's about. So yeah, yeah. I'm very proud of that. I'm proud of the, both of those because when I'd gone to Japan the first time uh, for, for this you know adventure, I went straight to Hyogo Prefecture where Kobe beef comes from, of course. And I was in Awaji where 70% of the Kobe beef is produced. And I met the producers there and I went to an auction in a slaughterhouse and I asked them all, what are the other places in Japan where there's good beef? And everyone pointed me to Kagoshima. And some people pointed out this olive wagyu. So I was on the trail of those two things before <laughs> the wagyu Olympics kind of, you know. That's a that's great for you. Is validate it. So it felt really, honestly, very satisfying. Because our hunt is, you know, to go to the ends of the earth to find the best beef out there. So so right now, is it just United States and Japan? Do you have any beef from anywhere else in the world? We have a couple of farms in uh, Tasmania. I was good. So in Westmore uh, is a, a farm in Tasmania. Um but we got a couple there. It's, it's, it's the place in the world where the world air quality index is pegged to that latitude and longitude coordinate of literally that area where the farm is. Wow. So it's like in terms of natural environment, it's the cleanest, most pristine you can possibly get. Um, and the, 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 the great thing about them is it's, it's also in the same um, latitude as the Pampas in Argentina. Okay. So it's, it's like the perfect place for growing grass. And so they have the cattle there have on pasture all year long, and they have fresh new grass that's sprouting and growing every single day. Wow. So it means that they're eating the highest quality proteins in that grass and nutrients to make the muscles and the the beef you know, taste really good. And there's not as much seasonality, but um, so it's excellent beef. Um, the farmer there is amazing, and so wow. so we just started. That's very recent. Wow, this week. discussion to make me want to get a meat freezer and order it from every. <laughs> Know, right. So, so how does the process work? So, someone someone signs up, someone pays for a certain amount, a specific amount. How long does it take for them, like generally, to get it? And then you also, I notice you have instructions on how to cook it, right? Yeah, yeah. We said um, you can pick whatever you want in terms of whatever cuts, yeah. and then you could also, you know, you could throw in some pork or chicken and yeah, different things. Great. We saw some um, salts now too, which are awesome. Oh, that's um, cool. French sea salt. Um, we also do. Um, so you'll just pick exactly what you want, and it shows up um, in a box, frozen. Um, and uh, we have cooking instructions for every cut you bought. Mm -hmm. So you'll get literally personalized down to the cut instructions. And then, so, so say I went on today. What's generally how long would it take? About a week. About a week. Yeah. So that's not bad at all. No. Yeah. That's really great. And then, and then you also have a book too, right? Yeah, we wrote a book last year because we were um, we were going on the road, you know, meeting these farms, and they were just blowing our mind with the things we learned early on. You know, like our first six months to a year, I had a notebook because I would just be like, I can't believe what I just learned. I'd write it down, and it was like these will be great blog posts someday, and it just sort of got upgraded into a book. Mm -hmm. So we wrote a book called Craft Beef, which is on Amazon and and uh, and, uh, and our website. Mm -hmm. If you if you're checking out, sometimes you'll be able to buy it on the checkout flow. Gotcha. But it's a book about our journey into this world of craft beef. We're saying, you know, with this book, what we're saying is like, beef is not a commodity. And, you know, come on this journey with us and we'll show you why and how, what that means. And the only reason that you can, you know, discover that it's not a commodity is by meeting the farmers, really. And the butchers and the restaurateurs who are on the cutting edge of beef itself. You know, so extreme dry aging and exploring nose to tail cuts and, you know, different cooking techniques and sous vide, as well as all these breeds and things we've just talked about and flavor profiles. It's all in the book. Oh, that's awesome. You guys don't you, you guys don't age the meat, right? That's not something that you guys do. Do. Yeah, most of our beef is dry aged. Oh, it is. Okay, okay. I, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, about 10 to 14 days typically. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, then I, I feel like an idiot, but a, a wonderful idiot. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, it's also something that almost no one else does. Yeah, you yeah. You know, most, most, like I said, we're, we're saying beef's not a commodity and let's do it as not a commodity. And everyone else is saying, oh, beef is, you know, and they're putting stock art photography on their websites and stuff, but they're just buying from the same brokers that have existed forever that control over 80% of the beef market. 
Um, and so none of that stuff is ever dry aged because it doesn't make economic sense. When you So they call it wet aged. Yeah. That's where if you put a beef in a bag, uh, you keep the water weight in. You don't want that water to evaporate out. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's priced per pound. Per pound, yeah. I was gonna say that. You'd rather have customers paying for water, wouldn't you? That's so we don't sell which, water. which is kind of illegal. <laughs> we don't sell water. We sell dry aged beef. It, it weighs a little less because it has less water, tastes better, and it's more tender. But you're, you want to put out a better quality. Yes, but it's all about quality. I mean, so it's it's for us, it's, it's all about the pursuit of of uh, access to variety and quality that you can't get in stores. And then a connection to the farm so you know it was done well and it was done right. Yeah, that's that's so amazing. And I can't wait to see more stuff about the different farmers. Are Pig-wise, are you guys getting pigs from United all United States? Farmers? Yeah, all, US, all USA. A certain, type of, a certain type of pig or is it? All kinds. We've got all kinds of heritage breeds, different feeds that they're using, you know, with acorns and hazelnuts and all kinds of great yeah. stuff. And the pork is like, once you, it's, it's like a warning, you know, once you've tried like, bacon or pork or pork or any any of the cuts from one of these it, it just absolutely blows away anything in the grocery store that's the one sad thing that you're, that you're doing you're, you're ruining everybody yes <laughs> You'll be ruined. Ruined. we're all ruined not a single person who works at crowd count will ever order a hamburger in a restaurant really of any kind even like a high-end restaurant hamburger because that ground beef is just not it's just there's no comparison our ground beef is like not even a little bit better. It just blows it out of the water. In fact, Shake Shack uh, is yeah, using okay. our ground beef in their Seattle store uh, for their signature burger. Uh, and they did that because when they came out, we met with them. We did some farm tours. They tried the beef, and it was they were impressed. The do flavor difference. Do you think they'll go nationwide with that eventually? We'll see. That'd be nice. <laughs> they should. I'm telling them right now. I, I want them to. because And, the, and their, their quality of meat is it's good quality. But it's, it is. Yeah. But I can imagine it's it's even better for yeah, I mean, when you taste like ground beef that sort of came out of a, a an animal that was raised for steaks, you know, and it was dry aged, it's just night and day better than like, because a lot of like grass fed ground beef that is sold online or in stores is, it comes from retired dairy cattle. Yeah. It's not, it, no one, they call them grinders. The industry calls them grinders. I've heard that term. Which basically means it's not good enough for steak. So just grind it, which is, um, we're, we're taking all of our ground beef from animals that are raised specifically for steak so it just tastes better do you have a wholesale side at all we're starting to look at that um you know obviously the shake shack is a wholesale deal we have um a couple of other partnerships underway or that we've dabbled in but yeah. you know our view is like we're building a supply chain um mm -hmm. a new supply chain for craft meat and so um half of all meat is purchased ultimately through wholesale mm -hmm. so we've got to get into it yeah, because I can't I can't imagine why a restaurant like a, a high end like high end steakhouses and stuff wouldn't want to somehow get access to what you have. Some of them already have maybe access on their own a little bit, but not to the. Not yeah, it's typically like if there's a chef who's passionate enough to go and forge the relationships with some local farm, but it's like it's very difficult to do that um, and coordinate the whole supply chain. But, uh, most of the time, actually, when you on a, when you see on a menu, you see like a farm sounding name, such and such reserve. Blah, blah, blah. It's not a farm. Nyman Ranch is not a ranch. It's not a ranch. It's a brand. It's a distribution company. It's a brand and a marketing distribution company. I'm not dissing them. I'm just saying if you use the word ranch, it'd be better if you were actually a ranch, wouldn't it? Yeah. Like our thing is like we're not trying to be a fake sounding farm brand name. We're actually just a marketplace. And we want these little producers who dedicated their lives to producing this incredibly rich and varied tapestry of craft meat we want them to get the credit yeah. it's, and also to get their product out there because how else do they yeah make it easier for them too the farmer's market is not a it's not a particularly easy place to go sell uh, beef no 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 it's not it's 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 and it's a grind it's it's a lot of work <laughs> it's, it's and they're already doing a lot of work on their on the other side yeah that's right thank you so much and sure. enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, okay excellent have, thanks so much